So with no further delay, I will turn the uh, mic over to our uh, professor tonight, uh, Dr. Michael Honey. Thanks, Dee. This is a pleasure uh, to be doing this, and it's the right weekend, of course, to be doing it. Um, as probably some of you know, I've written a number of books on Dr. King. Um, one is uh, called Going Down Jericho Road, The Memphis Strike, King's Last Campaign. Uh, another one is what some of you hopefully have read for tonight, which is All Labor Has Dignity, which is a collection of King's labor speeches, which was um, fundamental to me writing the other book because I just discovered these speeches one day when I was in the archives at the Martin Luther King Research Center in Atlanta. And I didn't know that he had labor speeches. Um, before I started doing work on King, I wrote two other books. Um, one's called uh, uh, Black Labor and Southern Civil Rights about organizing Memphis workers from about the 1920s up until 1968 when Dr. King was killed. And then I did another book called Black Workers Remember in Oral History where I interviewed a lot of black workers in Memphis. So I've got a deep background in labor and civil rights studies uh, and Memphis history. And then that sort of moved me naturally into researching more about Dr. King himself. Um, and so the last book I, I did, I, I gave a talk on this uh, network. I don't know when it was, but um, in 2018, I had a book come out called To the Promised Land, Martin Luther King and the Fight for Economic Justice. And that was uh, 50 years since Dr. King was killed in Memphis. And so I'm gonna take you through a story um, about King and about civil rights and, and economic justice. Uh, and I'm gonna use some pictures and some quotes uh, but I'm also going to draw on, especially at the beginning here, um, this book of King's Labor Speeches. So if you have some questions or thoughts, uh, try to jot them down um, as we go along. And hopefully by using some pictures and so forth, it'll be uh, interesting. Uh, one thing I find doing stuff on the Internet is having visuals really, really is helpful. So I'm gonna start out with this. Um, too many people think of King in a kind of a narrow sense as a civil rights leader. And we often see this on you know, King Day celebrations, uh, partly because civic leaders, um, oftentimes businesses, real estate, whoever's, uh, political leaders, everybody wants to get in on Dr. King Day and prove that they support civil rights. But a lot of these people don't really support the things that King stood for entirely. Uh, some some do and some don't. A lot of people don't really understand King. Um, there was a comment Dr. King made when, when he came out against the Vietnam War and he was so heavily criticized for criticizing American foreign policy. And this was 1967, a year before he was killed. And he said, well, I'm afraid you don't know me. You don't understand what I'm doing. Uh, that he, he never conceptualized himself as, quote, a civil rights leader. He was a black minister. Uh, a prophetic minister who looked at the whole picture of the human condition and who thought historically, he had a PhD uh, from, and he started at Morehouse College in Atlanta with deep study of black history um, in that consortium of colleges there in Atlanta. Um, actually, President Biden spoke there last week in support of the voting rights. Um, bills. And so uh, that's where W.E.B. Du Bois taught in, in, not at Morehouse, but at 
within that complex of uh, black universities. And King grew up in the 30s and 40s. That would be the Great Depression, World War II, and the aftermath of World War II, uh, the liberation of colonies all over the world through mass movements in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. King was aware of all these things. Uh, so really his framework always was primarily religious, but what does religious mean? Um, and so we're gonna talk about that a bit. Um, and But primarily religious was simply his way of framing what he saw in the world. He was very political and became more political as time went on. Uh, so when we hear people talking about the I have a dream speech, which is fine and I'm glad that everybody knows that speech. Um, sometime you might look at the footage and think, well, who are these guys in the little white hats around King? Uh, how come all these people have signs that say uh, jobs and freedom now? Where did all these people come from, 250,000 people? Well, this is the input of the labor movement in large measure. Um, those guys with the little hats are 1199 hospital workers or UAW workers from Detroit. Uh, they came on planes, trains, and buses from all over, funded by unions very much, and um, including many black women who were uh, fundamental to union organizing in, in all of these places, and uh, other black labor leaders. Um, People know about a Philip Randolph, who was from the sleeping car porters, who was the titular head of the demonstration, and Baird Rustin, who was the organizer um, of that. But then there are many other people. Uh, and so if you really want to know about the March on Washington from a labor perspective, uh, look up a book by a guy named Will Jones on uh, the 1960s. Free March on Washington. Uh, what what that uh, mass demonstration showed in 1963 was not only the civil rights movement, but it was alliance between the civil rights movement and the labor movement. Uh, so while in the past people usually thought of King as a middle class leader and a civil rights leader, our scholarship for the last oh, 20 or 30 years, has created a different picture entirely from that. Uh, the early picture of him, quote, civil rights leader, middle, middle class leader, that was from the mass media. Now there's a marvelous literature on King and the movements of the 60s and 70s and beyond. And I locate myself Actually, in labor history, uh, we've gone way beyond that idea. And um, so now, uh, and my work has been fundamental to this, we see him in a, what he called the kinship with the poor, uh, with working people and with unions. And it's really important that we get this straight in, in our minds uh, because it has to do with how we remember the history and how we apply that history to the time we're in right now. Um, Dee, let me ask you, is my voice and everything coming through all right? Yes. Okay, just checking. Sometimes you get unstable, something or other. So I'm gonna start with this quote in 67 at Mount Pisgah Church in Chicago. It's a black man who to a large extent produced the wealth of this nation. Uh, the black man made America wealthy. Some people talk about going back to Africa, but I'm not going anywhere. My grandfather and great grandfather did too much to build this nation for me to get away from it. So this is a, a fundamental thing that most people don't even know about, which is that King um, had um, slaves in his uh, ancestry, at least three. 
uh, members of his family had been enslaved. Subsequent to that, we had ancestors who were uh, sharecroppers and day laborers, and particularly his, his father and his grandfather and his uh, grandmothers. Um, so King called uh, the linkage between um, racism and labor exploitation a malignant kinship between race and class. He was very aware of this linkage that he had. Um, his, his father uh, built Ebenezer Baptist Church in the 1920s from a tiny little congregation into one of the most important congregations in Atlanta. And I would say 80, 90% of the people in that church were poor people. In 1964, when King got the Nobel Peace Prize, he came back from Sweden uh, to join the picket lines of black women, 800 black women on strike at the Scripto factory. And they won that strike largely because King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference joined in. Uh, so King, King had this framework uh, really from the beginning, uh, a, a man called to preach, uh, he said, is called to preach to the poor, preach to everyone, but especially to the poor. And his father was the same way. And of course, if you think about it, we're talking him growing up in the 1930s. He was born in 1929 at the beginning of the Great Depression in Black Atlanta, downtown in the downtown kind of area uh, where he was just surrounded by poverty and surrounded by unemployment homelessness and and all of that so how could he not you know be aware of those issues and then when he went to morehouse college his professors were very much aware of these issues uh, president benjamin may benjamin mays was aware of these issues they were all aware of Mahatma Gandhi and the um, nonviolent mass movement in India and other places that took place in the 20s and the 30s. So King had right away, just as a black student in this time period, uh, an understanding of and respect for the poor, uh, for um, struggles against colonialism and caste systems across the world and labor exploitation. So, and historians call uh, the 1930s and 40s the seed time of the Black Revolution. These, this is when the, the basic fundamentals for the challenges, the courtroom challenges to the laws and the personal challenges to the practices of Jim Crow uh, were developed. One reason we don't know as much about this or people don't grow up knowing about it is because of the Great Red Scare that happened uh, after World War II, which um, destroyed a lot of the American labor movement. Uh, the uh, Congress of Industrial Organization expelled 11 unions with over a million members. I mean, imagine this, like cutting off one of your arms and these were the most militant unions and the most pro-civil rights unions in the CIO. Uh, why? Because often they were led by communists. Who, and the Communist Party was the one group uh, of the one interracial group uh, in the early 20th century that made equal rights between uh, people of color and so-called white people. A fundamental organizing principle. They did organizing in the South, the Scottsboro campaign in Alabama, uh, many other campaigns, uh, the Emmett Till case, the United Packing House workers with a lot of Communist Party leaders in it, um, did a lot of organizing uh, in support of Mamie Till Bradley, Emmett Till's mother. Uh, King knew all these things. <laughs> he was, you know, he, he was. He knew what was going on in the world. Um, and so he was allied uh, when the movements got started from Montgomery onward. Montgomery, Birmingham, 
Selma, many other campaigns, uh, the unions were often backing him up with um, bail money, uh, bringing people to demonstrations, and especially when you start talking about places near, like New York City, the uh, left-wing unions that got expelled from the CIO didn't necessarily die out. Uh, one of them, the RWDSU, which it was uh, now it is trying to organize the Bessemer Amazon plants. Um, that was one of the big unions that supported King. And if you look at look at my edited book, All Labor Has Dignity, it's divided into speeches that he gave to the packing house workers, to RWDSU, National Maritime Union. Um, UAW, packing house workers, uh, 1199 hospital workers, and the International Longshore and Warehouse Union out here on the West Coast. King was practically a member of some of these unions. People saw him as that. Um, so the second part of this quote uh, or this comment, uh, when King spoke, and preached, he drew upon the knowledge of his slave ancestors and sharecroppers from which he was less than two generations removed. Um, and that history and like, you know, legacy is unknown to many whites, but it was a basic framework for King. And though we see him in pictures, well-dressed, middle-class, PhD, very articulate, well, <laughs> using that word advisedly, but someone who could speak better than almost anybody. Uh, probably the best preacher of his time, bar none, even Billy Graham. I mean, he's much more eloquent than Billy Graham and much more real, much more down to earth. But he also knew where he came from. And um, so what we find in looking at his labor speeches is that at the beginning, starting with the Montgomery bus boycott, and then going on from there, uh, he becomes more and more openly political, and I'll explain why. So let me go through a few images here. Uh, it starts with Montgomery, uh, the famous Rosa Parks, uh, and there were other people who had refused to abide by segregation on the buses, getting her getting arrested. Uh, black women were the majority of the riders on these buses. Uh, black women were fundamental to the Montgomery bus boycott for over a year. Uh, we don't have pictures of them. I had to find somebody to draw some pictures. Uh, King being arrested, of course, they bombed his house, uh, threatened his wife and children. Um, he thought he would probably die in that campaign, but he, he made it through and uh, they actually won some very significant court decisions and uh, desegregating buses, although then it took the Freedom Riders in the 60s to actually make it real. But after a year of protests, they, they won their campaign and they did desegregate the buses in Montgomery. Uh, moving on from there, there's a picture at Highlander Folk School. Uh, Rosa Parks is in that picture with King. Uh, and Pete Seeger and Ralph Abernathy, uh, who worked with King constantly. So here's here's the story. This is 1957, and King is working with this interracial group of people in the South and in the North uh, who are very much based in unions and who don't believe in segregation and refuse to abide by it. Uh, and this is the way it's portrayed in the South. King at a communist training school. I actually have a postcard of that from the John Birch Society of that time. So as soon as King started making openly making alliances with uh, people like Highlander and various union people who were often on the left, uh, these accusations of communism uh, began and dogged him throughout his life. And as I'm sure most of you know, uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI uh, constantly wiretapped him, threatened him, 
tried to stir up people against him and so forth. And this was the same Red Scare, you know, that everybody on the left experienced. Uh, King experienced it too. So the fundamental thing that drove King was this framework of nonviolence. This is a picture of him with Gandhi. And again, this is something where people don't really fully understand King. Uh, when he came out against the Vietnam War, he was always against it, but he came out with a very strong statement on April 4th, 1967, one year before he was killed. Um, he drew all the connections between imperialism, racism at home and abroad, and the war in Vietnam and the military industrial complex. He gave the kind of analysis that really mostly people on the left would have been giving at that time, but he did it from a Christian uh, perspective, a uh, religious perspective. And so when he said, people don't really understand me, why, why I would be doing this, uh, that's because they don't understand the philosophy of nonviolence. And if we have enough time at the end, I'll tell you something that's developing in nonviolence studies. But James Lawson, who brought King to Memphis, uh, when I interviewed him from a book going down to Hill Road, Lawson said, you know, um, a person who has a nonviolence framework automatically is a radical. If you're, uh, if you have that nonviolence framework, you're against violence in all forms. So domestic violence, you're against that. War, you're definitely against that. Um, economic exploitation, that's another form of violence. You're definitely against that. And what are you for? Um, so what are you for is um, an encompassing love for all people, for all humankind. That's the, that's the framework of nonviolence. And people do know that about King because, you know, you hear it in the I Have a Dream speech toward the end. He explains exactly what, he, what he's looking for in the future. And the night before he dies in Memphis, um, he has this speech with the phrase to the promised land. Uh, I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Well, I ask in my book, well, what was the promised land? To King, the promised land was uh, racial and economic justice and equality uh, for all people. So in his labor speeches, if you read through this book, it gives you some really good quotes. Um, to, to work from. Uh, and those quotes are really about filling out his view of, of what the dream is. So I want to quote for a minute his speech to the AFL-CIO in 1961. That's pretty early in his time. Um, that really we should think about today in the time we're in. Uh, he says, the unity of purposes between black people and unions is not a coincidence. Uh, black people are mostly workers. Our needs are identical with labor's needs. The labor hater and the labor baiter, baiter is usually a twin-headed creature spewing anti-Negro epithets from one mouth and anti-labor propaganda from the other. Um, black people and labor confront the same crisis, he says. Now, this is a warning. Unfortunately, it still fits our own times. Uh, whether it be the ultra right wing in the form of the Birch, John Birch societies uh, or the alliance between big military and big business or Southern Dix Dixiecrats and Northern reactionaries, these menaces now threaten everything decent in American life. They threaten everything decent in American life. He's talking about the right wing movement today, which has, you know, its roots in this time period that he was talking about then. Uh, so it's, King is often thought about as prophetic, and, and he is, uh, because he's sort of casting us to look ahead, where, where are things going? But he's also prophetic because he looks deeply into what's going on 
in his own time, and he's not afraid to say it. So he starts out with the framework of trying to get civil rights laws passed, and then the Voting Rights Act passed, and he and the movement succeeds. Um, 1964 Civil Rights Act, 1965 Voting Rights Act, and uh, millions of people are involved in the movements to make those things happen and to succeed. Uh, but a lot of people then thought, okay, now the civil rights revolution, as it was called at the time, is complete. Well, King didn't think so. He said that was only phase one uh, of the Black freedom movement. We can't get the things we want of economic and racial equality around the world. Uh, simply through civil rights and voting rights legislation. What that did was it made us citizens so that we can be effective. And the reason we had Jim Crow laws and laws taking away voting rights is to take away your citizenship rights. And we're in that same battle today. Um, the ultra-right wing, the Republican Party, uh, they're obviously brazenly, blatantly, trying to take away people's citizenship rights and make it possible for them to override the popular majority. And this is the very thing that King was talking about. In 1965, we thought we had gotten over that hump uh, with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And he said, okay, now phase two of the movement is for social and economic justice. And um, that included uh, uh, stopping America's military interventions abroad. Harry Bridges from the Longshore Union um, called US policies abroad American imperialism with a union label because the AFL-CIO supported the Vietnam War and most of the foreign interventions in King's time. So he had to fight even with the unions that he was making alliances with. In his uh, major speech against the Vietnam War in 1967, April 4th, he said, when machines and computers and profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. And he called on people to have a moral revolution to shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. Uh, I was very active in the anti-war movement in 1967. I was a college student at the time. And I thought, you know, I was following the Black Panther Party and the, the, the militant left, SDS and so forth, but I was also following King. And I thought, well, we need more than a, re a moral revolution. We need an actual revolution, like changing, you know, the gates, uh, who's, got, who's guarding the gates of, of power, changing capitalism and all that, all that. But as I've gotten older, I realized what he's saying, that the moral revolution is we need to change the way people think. Um, and then you can change the powers that be if you have the majority of people. And in fact, today we do. The majority of people are you know, in the king direction on most of the issues. Um, but the minority is in control uh, of so much of it. But um, I think that it's possible for us to shift from a thing-oriented to a person-oriented society. Um, and that's what he was aiming at, sort of a moral revolution that leads to an actual significant reordering of priorities is what he called it. Uh, I was in, um, Norway a couple of years ago as a visiting professor and you know it's predominantly white but it also has it's a very large migrant population from Africa and the Middle East uh, and what you find there is that you know it's certainly not perfect at all from a racial point of view but everybody has health care college is free really college is free you can even be an immigrant from Africa and go to college for free. Actually, they're recruiting students from abroad. Um, home health care, uh, 
family family leave for up to a year for both women and men. Um, unions, about 50% of the workers belong to unions. Unions actually have power over the workplace, making decisions about how things are done, what the products are, um, how production works and so forth. Not just uh, like a contract, but actually have power at the workplace. And this is a capitalist society. So King, King went to Norway to, to get the, um, uh, as part of getting the Nobel Prize. And he saw this, he called it the third way. He said, actually capitalism can be um, made habitable, acceptable. Uh, he was a socialist in his basic framework uh, at the economic level. And in his uh, moral philosophy, certainly he was as well. Uh, he saw Jesus as the greatest uh, figure in world history. And of course, uh, Jesus was all about uh, the, the life of the poor and changing the relationships of poor people and rich people. That was much of what he was talking about. But, but King said, so what is practical? What can we actually do? And I discovered in Norway, you know, a very strong labor history that changed the way capitalism operates in that country. So I'm not holding it out as like a utopia or anything like that, but what I'm saying is that what we're experiencing in the United States is not necessary. It's not necessary to have a country where people don't have health care as a human right. It's not necessary for people to live, poor people to live, uh, have full, as what King said in Memphis, full-time jobs at part-time wages. Uh, domestic violence, uh, so many of the ills that we see in our society, it doesn't have to be like this. So um, King called on us to be, quote, maladjusted to the tragic inequalities of an economic system which takes necessities from the masses to give luxuries to the classes. He said capitalism had to be reordered, reorganized, and gotten under control with a moral framework. And you can find this, you know, spread throughout his speeches uh, in the book, All Labor Has Dignity. So I'm gonna wind up just by jumping through a few things here. Uh, if you ever go down to Atlanta, you can see that this framework of nonviolence that James Lawson talked about, to me and that King talked about all the time uh, is very much fundamental to everything else. They have the six principles uh, lined up on tablets outside of the King Center. Um, I grew up in Detroit area and um, we had before the March on Washington of 63, we had the March on Detroit, huge rally. Uh, what I learned as a kid was that unions and civil rights could go directly together, even though there was a lot of racism in unions. Uh, it, it could encompass the United Farm Workers and Chicano workers, and um, that it was a mode of action that could confront even the worst violence of the Jim Crow system. This is King when he went on strike with, with crypto workers um, so there's a, there's a great history here of movement organizing. This is John Lewis being, being bitten to the ground. Um, the movement went from stage to stage, and you know, at the time it didn't feel successful. A lot of people died. A lot of people went to jail. A lot of bad things happened. But over time, what you see is when you have a mass movement, things start to change. This is King in Mississippi, the March Against Fear. Um, and again, the Mississippi, John Baez with him there. Detroit, 1967, um, the great uprising against police brutality. And all during the 60s from 64 to 68 when Dr. King was killed, there were these mass upheavals in the cities against poverty, against uh, neighborhood segregation, against redlining, 
against racial injustice in all its forms, especially against unemployment and poverty, but usually touched up by police violence. The same thing that we see today, uh, a police violence was endemic then. Uh, and the difference maybe was that the movements uh, against police brutality encompassed the whole picture of what was wrong. Our best movements did they do that? Um, but all these problems are interconnected and, and King was very good at explaining how those things are interconnected. Uh, he has a great speech uh, that's in the All Labor Has Dignity book where he gave it the speech to the union, but he also gave it in Gross Point outside of Detroit uh, at the time when I was a student. Uh, the speech is called The Other America, and it's really about the realization that as ugly as America sometimes can be, there is another America uh, that's a beautiful America of people trying to bring about change. And they may be in bad conditions and impoverished or whatever, but they're seeking a better world. And this was his framework, because how do we build up this other America and we should think about this now. One of the reasons King was so important was he was great at building coalitions. Through his moral framework, he was able to link together people from all walks of life and different ethnic and racial backgrounds. And um, it's this is not hero worship saying, oh, we need another king. The point is that coalition politics work. And the question now is how, how can we do that? today. It's not the same conditions. Um, the Memphis sanitation strike was uh, what James Lawson called a watershed moment where the, the civil rights movement and the labor movement clearly came together in Memphis. Uh, and King came and articulated that very well. Uh, and this slogan, I am a man, uh, was about the question of human dignity. It wasn't really about being a male. Um, the 1300 sanitation workers were all men, but everybody understood what that uh, statement meant. I'm not a boy, <laughs> I'm not your uncle, I'm a man. It was about the human dignity of all African-Americans. So this labor and civil rights alliance still lives on. Um, after this, after King was killed, um, a movement continued in Memphis. And we, I still consider myself a Memphian. I lived there for six years. We have April 4th every year, not only January 15th, but April 4th when King was killed to remember. And most of the unions do that too. And most unions know that King was a union person and honor him as such. Um, after he died, the Poor People's Campaign uh, moved on that he was trying to organize. And you see here a lot of the union people who supported it. And uh, we have a Poor People's Campaign today uh, led by Reverend Barber and um, Reverend Theo Harris and with people around the country working on this. Uh, I was there. Um, when on June 19th in uh, Washington, D.C., when we had a mass demonstration for the Poor People's Campaign, Coretta King continued on leading a lot of these movements. Uh, here she is with Dolores Huerta of the Farm Workers Union, uh, Cesar Chavez. And this is where I came into the picture as a young person in the student movement, um, going down south as a conscientious objector ending up in this little jail in Kentucky, um, working on the Angela Davis case, Free Angela, and um, other cases of police brutality and frame-ups against people. So I did all of that before I became a historian. This is the Wilmington 10 case. And then I got to go to Washington, D.C., work against the, the apartheid regime in in uh, South Africa and go to Howard University, a black university, where I could learn a lot of this history from black people. And 
and that was a fantastic experience. And that set me on the way to becoming a historian because I wanted to tell the stories. And so that's what I've continued to do uh, and to help people to understand the importance of this story. This was 2018 uh, when we celebrated 50, I shouldn't say celebrated, we um, commemorated uh, 50 years since Dr. King was killed and people came from all over the country and actually all over the world. Um, I got to be friends with somebody from Japan and they brought me to Japan to speak. Uh, and the unions were central once again to these demonstrations. Uh, so this uh, sign says it all, <laughs> the struggle continues. Um, we don't have the luxury of getting discouraged. Uh, we have some horrific people in power in the Republican party, but I think what they're trying to do is uh, turning back the clock, it's really too late. The clock has moved on and eventually will be past all of these people. So um, I think that's the end of my slides. And I'd like to take questions. Okay, we'll open the floor now uh, for comments and questions. If you'd like to introduce a, a question or comment, Please do not write it in the question box. Please click the picture of the hand on your control panel and we will open your mic. We scroll through and we will open your mic. I'd like to, uh, while I'm looking for a raised hand, I'd like to say uh, if you have not read Dr. Uh, Dr. Honey's edited book with the collection of writings, uh, speeches by Dr. King, um, All Labor ha Has Dignity. If you have not read that, I would uh, encourage you to do so. There are a zillion books out there we can read, but I would suggest strongly this is one that merits consideration, serious consideration. So I'm looking for raised hands. Um, Rick, your mic is open. Click your mic on your end. Rick, there you are. Hi. Can you Hi. hear me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk, Mr. Honey. And um, I put a question, a written one earlier, but I'll, I'll say it now. I didn't know I shouldn't have done that. Anyway, the Final Call newspaper had a great article this week about uh, Luther King his last years and particularly talked about the speech at Riverside Church beyond Vietnam. And it said how that speech turned everybody against King. And it said like the black people went against King uh, because he went beyond the civil rights and actually started criticizing the roots of America. And the newspapers, everyone just condemned him and said at that point, that was, well, exactly a year later, he was assassinated. And I'm, um, could you talk more a little bit on that history of that period, maybe, if you know, between that 67 and 68 and what happened to King and his loss of all his support? Well, I, would, didn't, I wouldn't say that he lost all of his support. Um, when he gave that speech, I remember it very clearly. Most of the people in the movement on April 4th, 1967 were uh, I wouldn't say elated, but very gratified because he explained exactly what we had been trying to say throughout the escalation of the Vietnam War. And he explained it so well. Um, Vincent Harding was one of the speech writers in that who was a great black historian. And they made all the connections about poverty, racism and war and imperialism. And what, what's the U.S. doing in this country, uh, you know, destroying villages, killing children, napalming families, three million people dying due to the U.S. policies in Vietnam. And then after that, Cambodia and various other 
huge atrocities happened. It's and it, it, it's a lot like what happened with the invasion of Iraq in Afghanistan, hundreds of thousands of people dying and ending up with what? Ending up with what? And all of that in our time, $3 trillion spent in the Middle East could have done so much. It would have funded schools, anti-poverty, um, education, healthcare, all the things they say that we cannot afford, we could have paid for with $3 trillion that was wasted in the Middle East. Well, the same thing happened with Vietnam. So I'd say yeah, not a majority of Americans at all um, supported what he said, but a large number of us did. And my estimation of King shot up at that time and so did many other people. After King was killed, Jesse Jackson said, we need to understand not who killed King, but what killed King. And what killed King was this ultra-right movement that I mentioned in his speeches uh, that they always hated King and they always hated the connections that he drew. And they hated him because he was black, because he was a black man. Um, and this speech then got played with by the mass media and uh, they made it even the washington post and the new york times i shouldn't say even i mean they were supporting the war pretty much up until this point and they said you know king has lost his value to his people i practically called him a traitor um, if you look at the southern newspapers which i did they do call him a traitor and they called Robert Kennedy a traitor, too, because he was trying to bring the war to an end also by this time. So a large part of official opinion uh, went against King. And a lot of the pro-war people, of which there were a lot of people, um, some of my uncles and aunts and other people who supported the war, uh, to them, this was almost like blasphemy, you know, that King should because he explained exactly what was wrong with it and uh people like to pretend that it actually we were doing good you know this was a good war and that we had good motives and we were helping people and you know people went over there to die uh and some of my classmates in high school thinking that it, they were doing some good uh and king shattered all of that in his speech um by explaining what exactly was going on so yes, it's true what the call said, you know, official opinion turned against him. And some people say he was one of the most unpopular people in America when he was killed. But that unpopular is among the right wing side of our population. And there was another side, the other America, where he was just as popular as ever, and in fact, more so. Okay, thank you. Dante, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. Dante, your mic is, click your mic, use your mouse cursor to click your mic on your end to open your mic. There you are. Right. Sorry, Mike. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. It was beautiful. Um, I had two questions. One is uh, on the role of Jack O'Dell around King and uh, the second is, given your analysis on King and his struggle for democratic rights in this country for all people, basically, um, but for black people in particular, um, what is your analysis of the struggle today uh, around this current stuff happening right now around the voting rights struggle? Oh. Uh, Jack O'Dell was a, a wonderful person. Um, I got to know him pretty well before he died. Uh, he moved to British Columbia eventually, um, and I'm on the West Coast. I'm not very far from there, so we got to know each other pretty well. Uh, he was a really great analyst of these things, and of course, he edited Freedom Ways magazine and wrote some of King's material until uh, President Kennedy took King aside and said, you've got to get rid of this guy because he's got 
ties to communism and also um, Stanley Levison, who was a financial advisor. These people were really instrumental for King. Um, they helped him to make links to these unions. And uh, also their analysis of things was very uh, insightful. And Jack had been around since uh, he was a little older than Dr. King. And he'd been in unions. He was a union organizer, in fact, during Operation Dixie in 1946. So he knew things from the inside out. And of course, what this came from was the FBI's campaign to um, make King ineffective. That's why the president was talking to King, was J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI came to him and said, you've got to get rid of these people. Uh, they didn't want it to be exposed that King was friends or had confidants who were associated with the American left. And so he, he, he did break his ties with them. But um, Jack went on to uh, be an advisor to Jesse Jackson and work on international issues and um, remained a you know great movement person. Uh, the second question about right now, I think we're in a dangerous spot on a number of levels. One, one is it's really discouraging. Um, it's depressing. I was really depressed yesterday. Uh, the right wing people continue to stop any improvements uh to the voting rights laws or any other laws that you know um health care that build back better and anything that the democrats come up with that would improve life in america they want to stop it and at the same time they're pro-covid you know they want to block any public health measures uh that would save lives because they want to destroy the Biden administration. I'm just telling you my opinion, but I think this is their strategy. And, and then they'll blame the Biden administration for not being effective on, on the um, trying to stop the virus. And they, actually, they are the ones that are causing it to be much, much worse than it ever needed to be. Well, the same thing applies with the Voting Rights Act. You know, that we know what their game is for 2022 and 2024. They're just setting it up everywhere where they can overrule the popular vote or undermine the popular vote or suppress the popular vote because they know they're in the minority on the issues. They are all the everything. You could ask about health care and employment and unions. Republicans are on the minority position on all of those things. So it's really easy to get discouraged because their ability to stop everything dead in its tracks. That's the time when you really need movement. You really need organizing. And um, I'll show you this if it'll come up. We just published this book with James Lawson, The Four Steps of Nonviolence Organizing. What are they? Uh, this is with the University of California Press, and we have a forward by Angela Davis. That's a beautiful forward. Um, and I think people should study and learn about the strategies. And we don't have the option of being discouraged. Um, we're in a life and death struggle over the climate catastrophe, for example, but on so many other fronts. We are as well, uh, but on the on the plus side, we have more people now than we have ever had in our history, who are well informed, who understand what's going on, and who are pissed, <laughs> and and want to move forward. Um, so we've got and we had the biggest demonstrations in American history uh, during the Black Lives Matter protests in the summer. Of 2022. So we really don't have the right to get discouraged. Um, what we really do have is the responsibility to organize. 
Okay, we'll take one or two more. Is that okay, Mike? Sure. Is right. did this uh, picture come up of the book? Yeah, we see it. When your mic is open, okay. when? Yeah, I I didn't have any question. I'm sorry. That's by mistake. Oh, your hand is up. Okay. All right. Now your hand is down. All right. Thank you anyway. All right. Looking for raised hands. Tom. Thomas Connolly, your mic is open. There you are. Hi. I, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation of Martin Luther King. He's one of my uh, one of my heroes over the course of my struggles here. His last book that he wrote, the Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos Your Community, is is one that I really treasure, and I wanted to know your opinion of that text. And I also wanted to say that where I'm organizing now here in Connecticut, I'm very encouraged uh, by the level and depth of organizing and some of the young people that are are getting engaged in the environmental issue and others. So I, I'm on the upside right now. Uh, and we're losing, I guarantee, I, I agree that we are getting our little butts kicked right now, but I, I don't think that's gonna last and I hope I'm right. But I, I just want your comments on that. That book is so precious to me. Uh, and it was his last one that published when he was assassinated the same year, but it includes comments like uh, uh, neo-fascism, fascism, he said something to the effect that uh fascism is a possibility that's back in 68 where he wrote and the other quotes in there are just wonderful in his program he had a program for progressive to move the country forward progressively in education healthcare, etc i just thought it was great i just wanted your opinion on it thank you i often assign that book if you know if i'm teaching a course on king or even if it's on something else you know, what's funny, at the time that that book came out, it wasn't very popular and uh, it was criticized as being sort of, oh, old hat, you know, and I mean, I think what it shows is that the movement in 68 um, was very radical and I was part of that. And um, people wanted him to say even more <laughs> about how, revolution should happen in the United States. Uh, but in retrospect, you know, 50 or more years later, what he says in there makes perfect common sense. Um, I, I think he was a little more pragmatic than a lot of us were who were younger than him and really wanted change like right now. And um, so he was in that book trying to think about coalition building and how can it be done? And trying to fill out a framework for that. And so, uh, yeah, it's and, and, and the question, where do we go from here? They always used that in their sessions in Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And James Lawson uses that now um, to think about, you know, you have to look ahead. It's not good enough just to go out and hold a demonstration. You have to actually organize people and you have to look ahead and have an idea of what things you can win. Uh, King was really good at, you always have to win something at the end of a movement, even if it's something small, like in Birmingham, opening up employment in the downtown, in, a, in the businesses, which weren't a huge amount of jobs necessarily, but they won something, they, they got an agreement, they made a change uh, after a huge sacrifice. And, you know, so we need, I, I think that book helps people to think about the process of organizing and what do you win and how do you win it. And I hope people will pick up this new book from the University of California Press also with that same idea. Um, this book is designed to fit in your backpack. It's, it's a short book. It's a cheap book relatively cheap book, it's 20 bucks, but it'll, in paperback, it'll be half that. Uh, and the idea is when you're, you know, waiting in a voting line or you're sitting in the street in a protest and you've got time on your hands, uh, read up on what James Lawson has to say because he was the teacher for John Lewis and so many of the freedom writers and other people in the early 60s. And 
continued on in Los Angeles, where he is a preacher now, he's 93, to help build various movements. And the labor movement is one of the strongest places in the United States is Los Angeles. And it's part, it's not, it's, you know, he's not a labor organizer, but he's certainly helped move it along. And partly because of the, the smart ideas about how do you organize. Okay, Dr. Honey, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to meet with us tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to share? Uh, well, Dan, I wonder, if, I see we were recording this. Is there some way that this can be put somewhere that other people can listen to it yeah everybody who registered will be able will receive a copy of the recording and um at some point uh, so we can send it to you as well okay mm -hmm. uh I've got a website and we're as part of this book and this film which is called um love and solidarity you well know, it's i've got a three minute video i could show you but yeah we're, okay Let's end, let's end with the video. But let me okay. say thank you. I enjoyed reading. All labor has dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm just trying to spread the word about organizing uh, through this book. And now I'll show you this little film. Uh, you can get this on Vimeo or you can get it on Amazon Prime, but you have to type in the words love and solidarity. So before you start the film, thank you everybody for participating. We'll end uh, with this little short uh, video here. Thank you for participating tonight. We look forward to seeing you at our classes in, fe in February, March, and going forward. Go on, Mike. Our power has always been in ourselves, in our people, and in our unity in the courage that we have to say no to racism and injustice. The concept of nonviolence is a 20th century term coined by Pandit Gandhi of India. Gandhi also goes on to say that love is power. It's the most creative power of the universe. It's the greatest force that's available to humankind. I needs to learn how to use it. A laborer deserves his wages. I think the wages of people who do the work is an essential ingredient of justice and of community. I think the human species was created primarily to learn to work. Physical work, intellectual work, artistic work, community work, social work. We have to work as human beings because it feeds our dignity. It feeds our sense of making a contribution. It feeds our sense of taking care of ourselves. So all work has dignity to it, is what Mark King said. All labor has dignity. And so work is not primarily for wages but we ought to be able to benefit from our work, especially the work that we do outside of the home and in the larger community. We cannot support the simple right of the ordinary man and woman in this society to have the full dignity of their work and their wages. And we must begin to tell the Democratic Party, stand up and be proud for human rights. Okay, thank you everyone and good night. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Honey. Thank you very yes, much. Thank you. Good night, everybody.